Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. I'm in one of my contradiction modes. Part of my body is cold, and the rest of my body is just sweating profusely. Anyway, don't get electrocuted. It's not fun. It's not the best way to get a free helicopter ride. Amen. Revelation 19, talking about the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Something that the poor amillennial brothers don't understand. They don't get it. They say that we're in the millennium already. And Satan is already bound. If that's as bound as Satan gets, number one, he's not very bound. Number two, if we're already in the millennium, then we don't have much to look forward to. But we do. We have something great to look forward to. We have on this earth a thousand-year period of no Democrats, no Republicans, no lying congressmen, no filthy, lousy, dirty judges, no communist dictators, no drug lords, and no warfare. I want to be a part of that, don't you? God's going to give this earth her rest. She is going to rest. God is going to give mankind a rest to look forward to. That's part of this study. I don't, it's not part of tonight's study, but it is part of this study that the millennium reign actually is the fulfillment of the Sabbath day. It is the Sabbath day. The great, big, gigantic, 1,000-year Sabbath day. All right, we'll read Revelation 19, but let's go to the Lord in prayer first. Uh, continue to pray for the folks that we uh, mentioned this morning and lift them up in your prayers. And um, just pray for... Um, all of God's people that are watching with us online, we thank God for you. You folks online, you pray for us. and Lift one another up. Yes, Mike. Okay. Laura's having a procedure done tomorrow at 1030. Where's that going to be? Barnes. Barnes Hospital. Okay, so pray for her. Todd, you have both hands raised for prayer requests or you just... Can't for my back. Oh, okay. Well, pray for his back. He's either prayer requesting or he's getting way too comfortable back there. <laughs> Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Heavenly Father, I love you. I thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day you've given us. I thank you, God, Lord, for visiting with us this morning. I thank you, Lord, for the blessing of the word that was preached. I thank you, God, Lord, for helping us along as a church. Lord, help us, dear God, to see your, uh, your goal, your plan for our church. Help us, dear God, to always abide, Lord, in your word. Follow after your word. Lord, we want to honor. Lord, we want to reach out to lost people. We want to help broken people. We want to meet people, Lord, where they are in life. We don't want to appear to be um, holier than thou or better than everybody else. God, that's not how we want to be. But, Lord, we understand we have an obligation to serve you first. And Father, Lord, you show us, you show us, God, that if we will seek your kingdom first and your righteousness, you truly will add all of these things unto us. So, Father, we are going to trust you in that. We're going to ask you, God, that you would lead us, that you would guide us as a church. Father, you would guide me as a, as a pastor, that you would guide these dear men, Lord, as elders in this church. But Father, Lord, you would show us the way that you would have us to go. Father, bless your, our study of your word tonight. We thank you for it. God, there's so many great, great, precious things that are in this book. And I pray, dear God, that you, the Holy Spirit, would deliver them to us tonight. Thank you for the gift of this book. We love you and we ask God to, to bless those that we mentioned. Father, be with Sister Laura tomorrow. Bless the doctors. They work on her, Brother Sterling this week, and so many others. God, we just pray, Lord, that you'd lift them up now and give them, uh, give them grace Give them blessing in their body. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Revelation 19, verse 11. I want you to look there quickly in your Bible. Uh, this is, I guess, the, um, the second coming, as it were. This is his, his appearance in order to come down to the earth 
and begin the process of his rule and his reign. So we find it in verse 11, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. I like that. Two names. Both of them are applied to the Word of God. Faithful and True. Is there any place in the Bible where God is not faithful? Doesn't exist. Is there any part of your Bible that's not true? That doesn't exist either. So anyway, he's called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he doth judge, and look at this, make war. So the question to ask yourself is, is there a righteous cause to war? The Bible says yes. There is a righteous cause cause over which to war about. And simply because Christ is going to rule on this earth and he's not really asking anybody's permission to do it. He already has it. And you can rest assured, we already know this, that if Jesus Christ were to come to this earth today and say to the world, I am your king and I am your leader, do you think everybody would be okay with that? No, absolutely not. A majority of this world right now would absolutely, they are rejecting Christ right now. And they would not, they would not go along with, okay, Jesus, if you want to reign, that's fine. They're not going to do that. And so Christ in righteousness is going to make war against the people of this earth. How foolish they are for thinking they can win that war. You lost. Amen? You lost when Jesus got a hold of you and shook you and said, you're going to serve me. And you said, I am not going to serve you. And Jesus said, I'll, make, I'll fix it to where you'll beg me to serve me. And it worked, didn't it? Amen. All right, so he's going to, he's righteousness, he's going to judge, he's going to make war. Verse 12, his eyes were as a flame of fire. Think about that. And on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Do you know what that name was, by the way? Nobody knows it but he himself. I don't know what it is. It says he himself. And he was, that was a trick question, by the way. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. So is it okay to think that Jesus and the Bible are the same? Absolutely it is. The armies which are in heaven, that's us. That is us. We have been redeemed. We have been called out. We have been translated. And we are the armies that are returning back with Jesus... The armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. I don't think I can remember a time ever when I rode a horse. I don't remember a time, I don't remember ever riding a horse. Who in here has never ridden a horse? Courtney's ridden a horse, hadn't you, Courtney? One time? Actually, the horse kind of rode her. Yeah, at Living Springs Camp, threw her off. She broke her, what was it, your ankle? And we were, we were all the way down close to Springfield at another Bible camp. And we got word that Courtney fell off a horse and broke her ankle. And we turned a three and a half hour trip into one and a half hours. Highway 44, actually, did you know you can go a lot faster than you normally do on Highway 44? I won't tell you how fast we drove. But man, I tell you what, we were scared to death. But anyway, I, one of these days, I'm going to get to ride a horse. A white horse. Amen, I'm looking forward to that. The armies which followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, uh, let's turn to, I always like to point this out every time I see this. Turn to, uh, you're in Revelation 19. Stay there. Look at the very beginning of that chapter. Very beginning of that chapter. 
I was, um, I have in my possession, I found this at Goodwill, it, a book, it's about this thick, and it's the Catholic Catechism. It is what Catholics believe. And I just picked it up today and was thumbing through it, and I got to the part on penance. And that doctrine is hellish. It is wicked. It says that you must pay part of the price for your own sin. I hate it. So here's why I bring this up. Revelation 19, verse um, 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Look at verse 8. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. If you have an NIV, a New American Standard Bible, a Message Bible, New English Version, Revised Standard, whatever it is, this verse has been destroyed in these new Bibles because it says, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints, or the righteous acts of the saints. That is wicked. Please tell me how many righteous deeds you have. Oh, your righteousness alone is as filthy rags in God's sight. God will not accept them. We are not going to be dressed in them. We are not robed in our own righteousness. We are robed in the righteousness that Christ has given us. See, it was granted to her that she should be arrayed. It was as a gift that God gives us. Somebody say amen. So if you look back now at, um, at verse, uh, at verse uh, 14, the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. We got that by way of Jesus Christ. Now verse 15, out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. That sharp sword, we know what that is, don't we? Since it comes out of his mouth, we know it to be our Bibles. Amen? And I want to tell you something. Listen to me. Every battle that you have fought, fighting now, will fight. You'll win it if you have the Word of God. You'll always win with the Word of God. Christ is going to fight every nation and every citizen of the world at that time. Christ is going to fight them with one thing. The sword that comes out of His mouth. And he's going to win. There is nothing, nothing that has as much power as the word of God. Not even your words. Amen? Not even your words. Remember that they tried to deliver that man who had seven devils in him? And uh, the devils took them all, whipped them, and stripped them naked, and made them run off screaming like little girls. Not trying to be, you know, be little little girls or anything like that, but that was how they did because they, they went in there and they said, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches to come out of this man. And that devil looked at him and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? Who are you compared to, and what are your words compared to the word of God? Amen? Verse 17, no, verse 16. He hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, seven words here, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel, that is his... That is his name as far as his, um, his authority to rule over every king and every prince of this world. Uh, who in here has ever been in the military? Okay? You wore some sort of insignia on your, on your shirt or on your sleeve or whatever that designated what your rank was. What rank did you have? The highest rank? Wow! Way to go, Sarge. What, what did you have? Oh. <laughs> Master Sarge. Oh, Air Force doesn't count? Joe, what did you have? Who else? Anybody? What did you have? Sergeant. Yeah. Huh? He was, we got a bunch of sergeants in here. Listen. The five-star general, Jesus, outranks all y'all. One man, one man, 
And he's king of kings. He's got it written. Got it, he's got his insignia written. King of kings and Lord of lords. He outranks them all. Somebody say amen. Now, I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together under the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, small and great. What does that sound like to you? What I just read. Both, uh, all men, free and bond, both small and great. Those that take the mark. He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark. And Tim LaHaye had the gall in his series about the end times. You know, he started out with the Left Behind book. and the Left Behind series in the book called The Mark, Tim LaHaye had it put in there. There was a man that ended up, he had the mark of the beast, but he didn't want it. And this is during, you know, what they call the tribulation. And he's worried now that since he's got the mark, he's going to go to hell. And somebody tells him, don't worry about it. God looks on the inside, not on the outside. Well, excuse me. The mark is inside. It's in the right hand and it's in the forehead. And the Bible specifically says, that anybody who has that mark is going to be a partaker of the lake of fire. No exceptions, no exclusions. That's how it's going to be. Just because some guy says in a book, well, I got the mark, but I didn't want it. It's okay. Just because somebody says that does not make it true. And I think that's dangerous. I think it's dangerous to tell a world of lost people. In this book series, a lot of lost people read this series. They read it, and they think now that if they see all the Christians flying through the air, well, I'll get another chance after that. So right now, I'm going to party it up and guzzle it down and smoke it and do everything I can until that happens, and then I'll get right with God. That is a setup. It's as bad as the Jehovah's Witness and the Mormons going around telling everybody that once you die, God will give you one last chance to get right with Him. If that was the case, I'd take it. But it's not. That is not the case. Watch out, people. God has given you the opportunity right now. Now is the day of salvation. So verse 19, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast which was taken and with him the false prophet wrought miracles before him uh, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshiped the image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. I can't wait. I can't wait. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse. Which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Listen, my friends and brothers, and those of you sitting here, those of you listening online, or those who are listening to this later. You can reject this Bible all you want to. You can say there's holes in it, mistakes in it. You can say that its language is outdated. You can reject it all you want to. It is that book that is, you're, you're, is, you are going to be judged by that same book that you reject. Amen? If I were you, I would read it. Amen? Now, Jude chapter 1 tells us this. If you want to turn to Jude, you can. Make, kind of make a little notation in your Bible. There was a prophecy given by Enoch. Now, again, very quickly, I do not believe the book of Enoch. I do not believe it. It is not in the Scripture, should not be in the Scripture. No one ever put it in the Scripture, and it should be rejected. Jude is not saying that Enoch wrote this. He did not say what some of the other writers of the Bible said when they were quoting the Old Testament. As it is written... By Jeremiah the prophet, or as Isaiah has said, it is written, so and so and so and so. When Jesus was confronting the devil, or the devil's tempting Jesus, Jesus said, it is written, it is written, it is written. And so I don't believe that Enoch wrote a book. I do believe that Enoch said this. How then was it preserved? God preserved it. Enoch said it before the flood... And Jude is writing this, and the Holy Ghost tells him, write this down. Can we believe that one? Sure can. Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, by the way, why, does, why do you think he had to mention 
that Enoch was the seventh from Adam? Huh? Give me your best guess, anybody. Why did it mention that Enoch was the seventh from Adam? Take a guess. Completion? Completion. Right? King of kings and Lord of lords. That's seven words. Is there any other king? No. no. It's over. It's done. So how many days in a week? Seven. Seven. What is the Sabbath day? Seven. Seven. He's telling you, he's associating the number seven with when what he said is going to happen. Read it again. Beho Enoch also, the seventh from Adam. Prophesied to thee, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him ungodly. I added that last ungodly in, but he puts a lot of ungodlies in there, doesn't he? I think that Jude, being led by the Holy Spirit to mention the fact that Enoch was seventh from Adam, to show the timing of this millennial reign. It will be on the seventh day. And it'll be, when this happens, there will be no more earthly kings, earthly mayors, governors, earthly princes. There will be no more after him. Jesus is going to be the last king on this earth. Amen? Does that make sense to you? All right. Deuteronomy 33. There's another place where this is mentioned. In fact, we're going to have a little fun here. Yes, sir. I like him. It's the 14th verse, 7 times 2. He's good. Did you raise him? What's it? Nah, okay. We'll blame that on John then. How's that? Yeah. Deuteronomy 33. You're go in fact, we're, gonna, we're just going to go through the script. We're going to have a good... I was, as I was studying this out, I was smiling. I was happy. That put me in a good mood. I like seeing things like this in the Bible. We're going to study thousands tonight. Thousands. Deuteronomy 33, 2, and he said, The Lord came from Sinai, and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with, there he says it again, ten thousands of saints. From his right, I like this, from his right hand went a fiery law for them. Now think about the duality of this. Number one, it has a fulfillment in Moses on Mount Sinai, God takes his right hand and he writes out the Ten Commandments. Writes them in stone, gives them to Moses. Moses goes down, his face shining as the sun, and he's there for all the people and they have the Ten Commandments. But that Ten Commandments deal is the Lord. When Moses comes from Mount Sinai down to the people, that is a picture of the Lord coming with ten thousands of his saints. Picture those two tablets as his saints. That's us. Because the law then has been written on our inward parts. We're not we carrying around Bibles in the millennial reign. We'll know every verse, every scripture, every bit of it. We'll know it. It'll be in us, all right? Be unviolated by us. So picture those two tablets as the Lord coming down with ten thousands of his saints. And here he does it again. But it says from his right hand went a fiery law for them. I think the Bible's indicating for you that Moses coming down was only a type and a shadow of the real thing that's coming down, which is the Lord. And since it's coming from his right hand, where is Jesus right now? Right hand of the Father. He is the fiery law that's coming down from heaven for the people. Isn't that beautiful? He's coming with how many? Ten thousands. What what John say up there? Is he just moaning and groaning or? Okay. I can hear it, but they're going. Wah, wah, wah. Somebody might have to check him and see if he's got a heartbeat here in a little bit, all right? And then look at verse 17. 
His glory is like the firstling of his bullock. And his horns are like the horns of what? See, if you don't believe the Bible, you don't believe this stuff. I believe in unicorns. Amen? Not little white ponies with rainbows. But a great, big, huge beast that existed on the earth. Elastotherium Sibiricum. And this thing had a giant horn coming out of his head. And the idea of a horn, how do animals use horns? What do they use them for? To get their way. Amen? You mess with the bull, you get the... Right. And when these buck deer come, when this, when, whenever this weather turns cold, for crying out loud, these buck deer are going to start taking a notion, and they're going to start using those horns to establish their territory. Okay? So here's the Lord coming down. He has in him, his horns are like the horns of unicorns. And Christ is literally going to, he's going to have to take this earth by force, isn't he? Because we already said that most of the people on the earth right now, if he were to come today, would not accept him as king of kings and lord of lords. And so he's just going to have to say, you know what, I'm going to have to do this the hard way. One way or another, people, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess. And I would rather do it now, softly, willingly, lovingly, than to be forced to do it before I'm cast into the lake of fire. Amen? He has like the horns of unicorns. With them he shall push... See, what, see that... Where, he said it right there. He shall push the people together to the ends of the earth. God is going to force everybody to meet in one place. And that's going to be where? Anybody know? The last battle that takes place, where is it going to take? Armageddon. The Valley of Megiddo, Armageddon. He's going to, he's going to force everybody to come to this one place and he's going to meet them there. And he's, he said, we're going to fight. We're going to do it right here and right now. And they are ten thousands of Ephraim and they are thousands of Manasseh. So here's what I want you to do. Can anybody think of another place or another story in the Bible where the thousands are used? Maybe it's 10,000, maybe it's 1,000, maybe it's another thousand. What do you got in mind, Caleb? Look here, very next place I have up on the screen. Turn there, Matthew 14. He and I think alike. Oh my goodness, what did I just say? We do think alike, Melissa. You should have seen me doing math. God's got a sense of humor. He allows me to have a ministry doing videos and writing books on Bible numbers, and I hate math. I hated it. I didn't do so well in it. Okay? So that's God using the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Amen? Matthew 14, 16. Here's what I want you to see. I want you to see a picture of what's going to happen when the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. Is that clear enough for you? Here's what, God, here's what God's going to do at this time. Matthew 14, verse 16. Jesus said unto them, They need not depart, give ye them to eat. Jesus is worried about the people that he's preaching to. Caleb, now you wanted this. Now listen to me, all right? You listening? They need not depart, give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, We have here but five loaves and two fishes. How many pieces all together do they have? Get it? That's cool, isn't it? And he said, bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two fishes. Looking up to heaven, he blessed. Which, amen, you ought to pray before you eat. Amen? Jesus did. He blessed and break and gave the loaves to his disciples and disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat and were filled. And they took up of the fragments that remained, how many baskets? How many tribes of Israel are there? You see what he's doing here? He's the, and Israel right now is fragmented. They're scattered all over the earth. What's God going to do in the last days? 
He's going to gather them all back together. These are, the, these are your 12 loaves right here. Your 12 baskets full is the 12 tribes of Israel that he's gathered back. And they that had eaten were about 5,000 men beside women and children. Number five is the number for what? You said it last week. Grace. Okay? So what here is God doing? He's showing you that at the time of his establishment of the 1,000 year reign, he is going to gather his own people back in Jerusalem and they're going to be his people once again. He's going to open their eyes. He's going to save them. He's going to feed them and he's going to be their God and they are going to be his people. Somebody say amen to that. And he's establishing that along with grace and it's going to happen for a thousand years. Does anybody else have another one? I'm not saying you're going to get the very next slide that I got here, but does anybody... Yes, J.R. The story of the fact that Daniel and they come to God and David says that God I had that in my notes, too. Let's see here if I can find it real quick. Saul has killed his thousands and David his... Let's see, where is that? I've got it in here somewhere. I know I've seen it. So hang on a second. No, no. We'll probably get to it in a little bit. Anybody else got another one? I like this. The number of people that left Egypt and the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 on foot that were men beside the children. I didn't count the children here, but they gave you the exact amount of the men that were traveling, and it was about 600,000. Thousand. This is a picture of God taking his people out of bondage, out of Egypt. And oh, by the way, when they left Egypt, where did they go? Mount Sinai. And what did God give them? That's him ruling for a thousand years. Oh, Psalm 91. I like this one. In fact, let's turn there. Psalm 91. This Bible's fun, isn't it? See, you could be sitting home watching old episodes of Leave it to Beaver. Instead, you decide to do something and come to church. Psalm 91, I love this chapter. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. I got in so much trouble for saying God has feathers. People didn't like that. But the Holy Ghost came down in the form of a dove, lighted on Jesus' shoulders. I just believe the Bible. And his truth shall be thy shield and buckler. They shall not be, thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walk in the darkness, nor for the destruction that wasted that. Four things here. Terror by night, the arrow that flieth by day, the pestilence that walketh in darkness, and the destruction that wasteth that noonday. Four things here. Fourth kingdom. Principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and spiritual wickedness in high places. God says, and these four things that are against you, don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of them. They cannot take away your birthday. Amen? And they cannot have your salvation. They can't have it. Amen? So don't be afraid of them. Now look at verse 7. This is the context of what he's talking about. A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. The whole story, and I don't care what you believe as far as end times prophecy, where you put the rapture, where you put this, where you put that, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter um, which version of that you believe. In every version, God protects His people. In every one of them. And He's saying to us, a thousand is going to fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand. It will not come nigh thee. Because God has not appointed us unto wrath. Psalm 68, 17, the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them as in Sinai. What did God do again at Sinai? Gave the Ten Commandments. He established His rule and authority over Israel. And here it is, the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. Who's to say, Ron, that... 
When Christ comes and, and takes us all into glory and he transforms us, he said to his disciples that ye shall be as the angels in heaven, right? So who's to say that, you know, some of those angels, according to Ezekiel 1, Ezekiel 10, Revelation 4, some of those angels are God's chariots. Wouldn't it be cool to be God's chariot? One who carries God around wherever he wants to go. Amen? In some way, I think we already are. Amen? Wherever God tells us to go, we go, and we always take him with us everywhere we go. That's sweet, isn't it? Well, I love this. Here's another one. Deuteronomy 32, turn there. Deuteronomy 32. I hope you're having, if you're not having as much fun as I am, I feel bad for you. I don't feel bad if you're not sweating as bad as I am. Deuteronomy 32. Oh, I love this. You know, our American forefathers, the men who built this nation, the men who established the laws of this nation, repeatedly referred to the book of Deuteronomy in their quotations. And they used phrases like, how should one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight? You see, because when we won the Revolutionary War, that was in the minds of a lot of the American people at the time, was that our little bitty country took the greatest army and navy on, which was the British Empire, and beat them soundly. So much so that they had to retreat and surrender. And that was never supposed to be that way. It was supposed to be a, a, a no contest that Great Britain would absolutely destroy the army and the navy of the 13 colonies. But God was in it. And how should, how could one chase a thousand and two put 10,000 to flight? How could it be? Except God were in it. And our forefathers knew that. Would to God that we made it mandatory that every person elected to a public office must read the Bible to know how to rule. That was a requirement to be king over Israel. He must take, write him a copy of this book so he'll know how to reign over the people. Let's look at this verse. How shall one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight except their rock had sold them and the Lord had shut them up, the Lord being against their enemies. And that, and that phrase, except the Lord had sold them and the Lord had shut them up, I, I think it's referring to the enemies that they're fighting against. How else can you win the battle except the Lord do it for you? The Lord is going to cause us to chase a thousand and put... Think about it. He said two to put ten thousand to flight. Where two or more are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. If any two agree as touching anything in heaven and earth, it shall be done. Why? The Lord's in it. The Lord is in it. He cannot, he's not to be conquered. Look at Leviticus 26. It says the same thing. Five of you shall chase a an hundred, and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight and your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. How is it that Revelation just told us, Revelation 19 told us, how Jesus destroyed all of the armies of the earth. How did he do it? The sword that came out of his mouth. Now let's take this and put it on a spiritual level. Who in here has ever been harassed by devils? People ask me sometimes, said, uh, Brother, have you ever been threatened by, you know, like the Masons or the Illuminati or something like that? And I guess they want some juicy story. And I tell them, no. No. Really? No. It's, it's never happened. I'm not sure that it'd be a big deal to me. What gets me is not the men coming against me. 
spirits. When spirits come against me, I don't do so well. You okay back there? Am I keeping you awake? I'm sorry. Man, you got me going now. Everybody yawn. Some of you are eating it. You're fighting it off, aren't you? Okay? <laughs> don't yawn. Whatever you do, don't yawn. <laughs> yeah. Now we got us all going. Anyway, when devils decide to crawl on me, I don't do very well. And there's been times, I mean serious days, when I have really seriously thought about just folding it up, walking away, getting out, leaving. Devils doing that to you. Evil spirits do that to you. And the only way I know how to, I don't fight them by raising my voice and saying, I command you in the name of Jesus to leave me. I don't do that. I'm not like that. I get my Bible out and I make myself read out of the Bible, usually out of the book of Psalms. I make myself do it. Alicia's yawning back there. And I pray. And then I'll read some more. And I'll pray. And then I'll read some more. And then I'll pray. And I might get some other people in on it. I might send a text out or make a couple phone calls and say, I really need prayer right now. It's very serious. I need prayer right now. And I have done that before. And I'm telling you, literally, I have felt and seen it when the devil's left. It's just like, boom, they're gone. And you're going, they're gone. You ever been through that? It's real. Joshua 23.10, One man of you shall chase a thousand for the Lord your God. He, he it is that fighteth for you as he hath promised you. Guess what happened? The man showed up, chased all the dragons away. Chased all the owls away. Chased all the bitterns away. Chased the satyrs away. Chased all the snakes out. Amen? Run them all off. He showed up and they were gone just like that. I've seen it over and over and over. And I, you've heard me enough to know I think God is preparing His people to fight a really big battle that's coming. And He's training us so that when this thing hits and when this day comes, we'll, we'll know what to do. We'll know how to act. We'll know how to react. We will know by the precious promises given to us in His Word exactly what it is, why it's happening, and what we're going to do about it. Amen? We're in the army. We are the soldiers in the army. And God is training His army right now. And you know what? The more times I do this, the more experience you get, you're not as afraid as you used to be. Because you know, it's like what I was preaching this morning. I don't know if this part of it came out. And that's what I had in my heart yesterday when I put it together was, whenever something major hits me, I'm a little better at dealing with it than I used to be. Because of one thing. My history. I look back in the days of old, and I remember how God delivered me on this day, and how God delivered me on this day, and what God did for me on this day here, and how God showed Himself to me on this day here. And I look at the sum total of everything that God has done for me, and I ask myself the question, Mike, do you think God is going to leave or forsake you now? No. Then He's going to win this battle. It is guaranteed He's going to win this battle. You just wait and see the work of the Lord. The power of God. The glory of Almighty God. You just wait and see. It will happen. They that wait on the Lord shall. He didn't say might. He didn't say maybe it might happen if you're good enough. He said they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall 
mount up with wings. Do you really believe that's going to happen? Is he okay up there? I think he fell. By the way, did you hear Marilyn Manson fell? He was at doing a concert. And this, I'm not kidding you. This is on the internet. Some guy, uh, David Taylor, the guy from uh, Salt Lake City sent me this on my phone. I just watched a little clip of it. But he's got like two props like pistols up on the stage and he's climbing them. And the thing collapses and fall, makes him fall and he falls right on top of him. I hope it hurt him real bad. That guy is wicked. That guy is evil. Okay? And, and the guy, but the guy said, do you see it? He fell. Just like Satan. I'm going, yeah, it happened. But I'm just, every time something happens, I see the power of God working. And I know how God did it before. And I'm just going, okay, God, do this again. And Jesus said that in the resurrection, you shall be as the angels of heaven. And those angels have wings. And I just believe that we literally will mount up with wings as eagles in that day. Okay? Just, just ponder that for a while, all right? Uh, Deuteronomy 1, let me read through some very quickly because I want to finish this out. Uh, the Lord, your God of your fathers, make you a thousand times so many more as ye are. Think about that. That's what he's going to do with Israel. Deuteronomy 7, Know therefore that the Lord thy God, He is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love Him and keep His commandments. To how many generations? I, a thousand generations. I think that means the, the millennial reign generation of people. Judges 1.4, Ooh, I like this. And Judah went up and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand and they slew of them in Bezek 10,000 men. I think it's a picture of the Lord's coming. They slew of Moab at that time about 10,000 men, all lusty and men of valor, and there escaped not a man. If you're a man, on this day, you are going to lose that battle. It's guaranteed. Somebody say amen. Listen, the fix is in on this one. If you were going to bet on this fight, bet on Jesus. He's going to defeat the armies of the aliens. That's out of Hebrews 11, by the way. Who are the aliens? Who are the aliens, Caleb? That's exactly right. That's who the aliens. I believe in aliens. I believe in chariots flying through the sky full of lights. I believe people see these things every now and then. And I believe that they are devils. And I believe they're going to come down to this earth and invade. And I believe that we're going to kill them all. Amen. Oh, listen to this. Uh, I'm trying to move through some of this. Very, I got one in particular that I just really wanted to slap you with, and that was going to let you go. Judges 4.14, 4, Deborah said unto Barak, Up for this is the day which the Lord has delivered Sisera into thine hand. Is not the Lord going out before thee? So Barak went down. He went down from Mount Tabor. You see that? Anytime somebody comes down from a mountain, it's like the Lord coming down. And 10,000 men after him. This battle is a picture of the Lord coming in his millennial reign. The Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Oh, let's see here. Here's uh, Samson in Judges chapter 15. How many Philistines did he kill? A thousand. What did he do it with? A jawbone of an ass. Uh, Psalm 50. Uh, let's see here. There's, there's one I just really wanted to get to you. Where is it? Psalm 50 verse 4. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And the heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself. Selah. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, then I will testify against thee. I am God, even thy God. I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices or thy burnt offerings to have been continually before me. I will take no bullock out of thy house, nor he goats out of thy folds. For every beast of the forest, I like this, for every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. He already owns it all. Amen? I know all the fowls of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine in the fullness thereof. That's his authority to reign over the earth is that it's his. He made it. He has 
In legal terms, he has the copyrights to it. Just like if you wrote a song or a poem or made a movie or wrote a book, you put it out there and it's yours. And if anybody steals it and puts their name on it, they're guilty of a crime. This world is God's. The cattle on a thousand hills belong to God. So when Jesus comes back, there's a bunch of people led by Satan who don't want Jesus to have it because Satan wants it. But he says to Satan, it's not yours, devil. Puts him in the bottomless pit. He takes the beast and the false prophet, throws him in the furnace of fire or the uh, lake of fire. And he rules this earth that he already owns for a thousand years. And there's a pic the picture of this is this. There are things sometimes that we lose that belong to us. Now some of these things, as we go on in life, we realize, I didn't need them anyway. Some of them are precious. And Jesus says, you know what? The devil's a thief. I'm going to give it back to you. Amen? He can do it. Because the devil is a thief and a robber. And he'll steal and he'll destroy. Ask God to give it back. Amen? Let's stand to our feet. I've had fun. I don't know about you. I've had fun. Imagine that, having fun reading the Bible. The lost people don't get it. Lost people don't get it. Maybe we can ask God to save them. And they'll get it then, won't they? Amen? Gwenny, are we going to pray and go home now? Okay. Hold your hands, darling. Okay. I'll give you candy. Well, look at her now. I love you, darling. Father, in Jesus' name, I love you. I thank you, God, for blessing us. Thank you, God, for the journey through your word. Lord, I did not even touch the hem of the garment of this tonight. Lord, your word is so powerful and it's so rich. And Lord, it was a joy to go through the word tonight and see the victory that Christ gains over everything in this earth. And Father, forgive us, Lord, because we don't see what you see. We don't know what you know. So Lord, the only thing we have is our eyes. And Father, the only thing that we've learned to trust is your word. But sometimes what the devil does to us can be pretty scary. And because we don't see how it all is going to turn out, we do get scared. We get afraid. I have been very afraid, God. You know that. But in those times, Lord, you told us to call upon you and trust in you and trust your word. And we see very clearly tonight from your word, God, that your word is alive. It is right. And it's, you are going to do exactly what your word says you're going to do. So, Lord, give us, fill us with hope. Fill us with understanding of your word, God, in any battle that we fight, anything the devil has stolen. God, give it back. Because he don't, he don't deserve it. He shouldn't have it. God, would you give it back to your people. Father, we love you and we thank you, Lord, for this good time, this good fellowship. We pray, Lord, you dismiss us now. Keep us in your, in your grace and in your mercy this week. Help us do our best work this week. But Father, Lord, supply us grace where we don't. We love you in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. It's good to be in God's house tonight. Amen.